Good morning, Delta Church, and welcome back to our weekly Sunday service. It's nice to have everybody who's tuning in to join us. And if this is your first time, I invite you to worship alongside us as we get into the worship as well as when we listen to the sermon. And with all of that said, I hope uh, you enjoy the service and thank you. been a moment you were forgotten you are not hopeless though you have been broken your innocence stolen i hear you whisper underneath your breath i hear your sos your so darkest night it's true i will rescue there is no distance that cannot be covered over and over you're not defenseless i'll be your shelter i'll be your arm I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the dark. We're at the point in our service where we read publicly our scripture. We've been working our way through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 to 12 today. So follow along with me. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. When he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace and the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. The locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had looked what looked like gold crowns on their heads and their faces looked like human faces. 
They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron and their wings roared like the army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek Apollyon, the destroyer. This is the first, the, this first, the first terror is past, but look, two more terrors are coming. May God add his blessing to what we've just read. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for bringing all of us here today so we can enjoy uh, fellowship and praise you as the body of Christ. God, right now I ask that you would prepare our hearts for the rest of this service. I know that we're going to be looking into your word and we're going to be challenged, Lord. So would you, Holy Spirit, allow our hearts to be open to whatever you have to say. God, we, we recognize that we don't just do Sunday morning for the sake of tradition. We don't do it so that we can feel good about ourselves, Lord. We do it so that we can have a purpose. We do it so that we can come together and focus and learn about you together and be um, excited and filled with a sense of mission for the rest of our lives, God. This is, this is a point where we get to touch base in the middle or beginning of our week and then go out and serve you. So Lord, today I pray that you would refresh our hearts and our mind. Would we have the scriptures illuminated today so that we can obey you in a, in a new way, God. I ask that you would just search our hearts, Lord. Would you convict us where we need convicting? God, I ask that you would bring a deep sense of peace where we need that peace. Lord, I ask that you would bring some of us joy when we're feeling low, God. Would you give us through your Holy Spirit those uh, experiences and that perspective that only you can give, Lord. We love you so much, God, and we ask that in everything we do today in uh, the sermon or the service, but also as we live our weeks, God, that everything we would do would be to your honor and your glory. And so we trust you, God. We trust you that you will be with us, that you will help us do that. We love you so much, Lord. Be with us today. And in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Dry land, like a flicker of sight to a blind man. I saw the glorious light as it broke in. God of mercy and might, oh, oh you, you brought, brought me back to life. You're the Lord of light, shining in the dark. You're the source of life, beating in my heart. You're the living hope. You're the
light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in. Let the light in. Hi church, my name is Pastor Free and I am here with your weekly announcements. Firstly, we have Soul Care and Prayer Group Monday nights at 7 p.m. It's a small group hosted by Pastor Jeff where we can connect and pray with each other and enjoy fellowship with each other. We also have our Oasis Women's Small Group meeting Wednesdays. So if you need that information, you can contact us and we will get that to you as soon as we can. Lastly, this week is Delta Mids, as it is the second Friday of the month. Those in uh, grades 6 to 8 will meet with us at uh, the church in the youth center on Friday night at 7, from 7 to 8.30. So if you are uh, Delta Mids or you know one, make sure to invite them. We would love to see you there. Now that's all the announcements I have for you. Continue watching the service. I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you next week. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, it's rolling along and we've had some sort of social restrictions for over 13 months. The vaccine rollout is getting gaining steam, but of concern, so are the variants. We simply don't know what the immediate future will be, but we do have hope for, a, for the more distant future, maybe a couple months away that they may be better in every way. But stories like what's recently happened to the Vancouver Canucks hockey team do make us pause and perhaps redouble our efforts to stay in place and practice social distancing and wear masks and sanitize our hands consistently. And I'm down with that, but I also have frustrations and I know I'm not alone in them. One is that there seems to be a lot of inconsistency between jurisdictions. In different places, there are different rules and different responses. For instance, in some places, restaurants and gyms and public meetings of all kinds are closed down and in other places, they're open, albeit in a limited fashion. Here in BC, where Delta Church is located, we've not had the opportunity to meet together to worship in our church building for over four months now, since the end of November 2020, whereas in other jurisdictions, churches are open for limited size meetings. In BC, weddings, funerals, and other special religious gatherings have been limited up until now to 10 people. People are forced to make unwanted and difficult decisions about these passages of life. And all of these restrictions are invasive and people are weary of it all. In BC, the restrictions to religious meetings have caused a lot of frustration. It's actually some court cases and, and a lot of discussion surrounding freedom of religion and association. But, but the restrictions have also forced us to engage in conversations about what forms of the church are valuable and helpful. The truth is, in the complicated relationship that we have with God that's filled with His grace and mercy and forgiveness and, and new creation, we often become attached to form, a, a form at the expense of our relationship with Him. What I mean is, the court cases of churches against the provincial health order in BC are focused on form. And frankly, I'm glad of, the, of these cases because I always like clarity about things I'm involved with, although I do know that's not always possible or realistic. So with the health orders during this pandemic, the form of how we practice church has been limited. And this is the form where people associate with a certain group at a particular location and gather together in person on Sunday mornings. That's the form. And that's the form that is going to court, as it were. So the question I have is this. Is this form the only valid biblical form that the church must have? And my short answer is, it's my conviction, the Church of Christ Jesus isn't tied to any particular form. In fact, not being tied to a form is what makes the church so compelling and adaptable and powerful throughout its history. In fact, the Church of Jesus Christ has had many different forms throughout its history. When the church first began, people met wherever there was a convenient place to do so. The church began in an upper room where Jesus' disciples and others were gathered, waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that great experience occurred at the celebration of the Feast of Pentecost some 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, Acts 2, 1-4. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. 
Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Everyone was present was filled with the Holy Spirit, began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And so as the, as the events progressed that day of Pentecost, Peter preached to the crowds that had gathered and approximately 3,000 people expressed faith in Jesus and were baptized. That's what Acts 2.41 tells us. But these things didn't happen in a building, but in a square, kind of like St. Peter's Square in Moscow that many of us have, or Tiananmen Square that many of us have seen pictures of or on TV. So this large church existed with no building or worship team or kids ministry or amplified sound or lighting effects yet it was still the church for decades after this happening in jerusalem the many people who followed jesus all over the roman world were added to the church but there weren't any church buildings People met wherever they could, in synagogues or meeting halls or open air or in people's homes. Yet it was still the church. After some decades, some Christians thought it would be a good idea to have a dedicated building so that they could meet together for worship and baptisms and teachings more conveniently. And so the first church property was acquired and the first church building was constructed. But this didn't happen until the middle of the 200 A.D., and certainly it wasn't widespread for many more decades. This form of the church in the early Roman world was anathema to Rome. And for generations, this church, this kind of church where they didn't have buildings and all of that, were a persecuted group until Roman Emperor Constantine recognized the church and made it an official religion of the Roman Empire in 313 AD. And after this, more and more dedicated buildings for the church to meet, to meet in were constructed. And eventually these became, these are what we, what became associated with the word church. But in its most pure definition, these buildings are not the church. The church is a group of Jesus followers. Jesus said where two or three are gathered in his name. A group of Jesus followers that are authentic, born again, new creation, forgiven of sins. And when they gather together, that's the church, not the building. They're the church because the presence of the Holy Spirit in them together forms them into the spiritual reality for the good of the world. And the elements that were important in the early church are actually identified for us in Acts 2.42. Where it says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And you know what? These are still important elements for the church in 2021, no matter what form it takes. These elements mark the characteristics of what a church is at any time and in whatever form it's in. Acts 2.42 is actually a template of the church, and it's at this foundation that this pandemic has challenged many of us, especially with the focus on the fellowship part and the eating together part. The truth is we need the connection with each other that being together brings, and that's not possible to do in a big group right now. Many of us can definitely relate to the story Nikki Gumbel tells that illustrates our need for each other where a young adult became a Christian when he asked Jesus for forgiveness of his sins. His faith matured, and after a while, he was strong and faithful and, and was actually being considered for leadership in the church. But after a while, because of circumstances, this young man slowed his fellowship with other Christians, and gradually it waned or waned to times of very infrequent fellowship. And you know what happened? He began to struggle with issues in his life. He thought we're already taken care of through Jesus' forgiveness and we're in his past. He found himself being tempted and following into some of the same sin patterns that he was involved with before he came to Christ. He was backsliding in a very disastrous way. And an older Christian man who was a friend of his who'd been instrumental in this young adult's growth as a Christian noticed what was happening. And he chose to visit him one cold winter night. The young man greeted his friend at the door as coldly as the outside temperature. 
His friend came into the house. He didn't say anything in return, but went over and sat in front of the fire that his young friend had burning in his fireplace. He'd sat in that chair at other times, enjoying the connection they'd felt together, talking about God and praying for one another. So the young man came over, joined him, and actually noticed the pain in his friend's eyes as he stared into the fire. You know, no words were spoken for a while, and then the older friend stood up, took the tongs by the fireplace, and pulled out a glowing ember out of the fire. In a few moments, the glowing ember stopped glowing, and a weak little black ribbon of smoke started to rise out of it. After a few more moments, the old man picked up that now cold ember and put it back into the fire where it quickly began to glow with the heat again. Then his friend went to the door without saying anything and left, leaving the young man alone to ponder the lesson. You know, for the sake of brevity, the lesson is this. The connection with others in the church isn't an option in the growing Christian's life. And it's this truth that's at the heart of our frustration with the pandemic. Some of us are finding it hard to maintain our spiritual growth without the face-to-face -face connections. The truth is, when you ask Jesus to forgive your sins and live in your heart, you become part of the church. And of course, the point is the church isn't a building, but a people. It's not an organization, but an organism. The church is the representation of Jesus on earth today. And it means that if you're a Christian on this earth, you are Jesus' hands and you're Jesus' feet in your family, your neighborhood, your place of employment, and everywhere else. Now, I want you to notice that I just used pictures to convey what the church is just now. It means that the church is a people, an organism, a picture of Jesus' body. It isn't a building. The Bible often uses pictures to convey the truth about something and to give it identity. For instance, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. We, we understand that picture. And I think God created us to relate to pictures because they're often so memorable. In fact, when it comes to what the church is, the writers of the New Testament use over 100 different analogies and pictures as, as descriptors. Now, I'd like to focus on a couple of them in this sermon. The Bible describes the church as the people of God. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are not like that, for you are, you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I'm Canadian by birth. What that means is, because I was born within the human-made geographical boundaries of the earth that has been named Canada, I automatically became Canadian. And I've met hundreds of people throughout my life, and I know many others weren't born in Canada, but were born in Holland or Haiti or Uganda or the United States or any other countries. But some of these folks came to Canada and changed their citizenship from their country of origin to Canadian. And all of us together could be described as being the people of the nation of Canada whether we were born here or chose to become a citizen of Canada from another country. And it's the same way with us Christians. By asking Jesus for forgiveness of sins, you're changing your citizenship to what it, from what it is right now to that of heaven. And this is what Paul refers to when he wrote in Philippians 3, 20 to 21. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. You know, if you've had the privilege to go to a foreign country, then many times you're going to buy shirts, hats, buttons, and pins that advertise you're a Canadian and you're going to wear them in the places that you're going to go visit. It's as if you're a roving ambassador from the country of Canada. And I think it's important to live up to that declaration of shirts and other paraphernalia you're wearing. Or you could be part of fostering a bad reputation of your fellow citizens in that country. And I think that's probably how the term ugly American was coined. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul wrote this about us. 
So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. You're an ambassador. I'm an ambassador if you're following Jesus. And, and we're ambassadors of God. We're ambassadors speaking on his behalf. An ambassador is a representative of a foreign government in a foreign land. Your citizenship is somewhere else. You're an ambassador of God, of heaven. And if you follow Jesus, that makes you one of Jesus' ambassadors here on earth. You're part of the people of God where you no longer belong to this world uh, of, and, and the world's ways of doing things. Hebrews 11 discusses the faith of many of the Old Testament saints and says about them in verses 13 to 16, All these people died still believing what God had, had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. And that's why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. So, so this strong picture of the church is that you and I live in this world as the people of God. We're Jesus ambassadors. But while we're here alive on this planet, we find ourselves longing for a better country, a heavenly country, our home. So that's the, one of the pictures of what the church is, even in the midst of a pandemic, of what, who you are and what you are. You're part of the people of God. Now, another New Testament picture of the church is that we're the family of God. The Bible says, as followers of Jesus, you're children of God and God is your father. Now, biblical truth is such that it tells us that as our creator, God is the father to all of us. However, it also clearly teaches that many of us humans are estranged from God and the whole purpose of salvation is to overcome that estrangement and get us back to the right relationship with God as our father. I mean, think of the story of the prodigal son. Isn't that kind of what it's all about? The truth of our status is clearly announced in John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. And it's this spiritual fact that gives the Christian church its unity. Every Christian has God as their father, Jesus Christ as their savior, and the Holy Spirit as their indweller. We're all reborn into God's new spiritual family. We all belong to one family. And just like a normal family where brothers and sisters may squabble, fall out, or not see each other for long periods of time, they still remain brothers and sisters. Nothing can end that relationship. And it's the same for the spiritual family that is the church of Jesus Christ. And so as the church, one of the things that you and I really have to work hard at is maintaining our unity. We, we can't settle for disunity. And this is what... Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 17, 20 to 23. And this is part of a, a prayer he was praying before the night he was betrayed. He says, I'm not praying. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. And then in Ephesians 4.3, Paul wrote, Make every effort to keep yourselves unified in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. 
Now, this is often a huge challenge in the church, and it's why in many places the writers of the New Testament declare that interpersonal sins are wrong, and by participating in them, we'll miss the kingdom of God in our lives. In Galatians 5, 19 to 21, Paul wrote this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's quite a list of sins, and a lot of it has to do with people not getting along with each other. Those who continually live this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're all sisters and brothers in the family of God, and as such, it's so important to be working through disagreements and quarrels and work hard at being in unity with each other. John 4, 20-5-1 1 John 4, 20 to 5, 1 declares that since we have the same father, we're spiritual siblings of each other. And as such a family, we're called to love one another. That's what it says. If somebody says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he's given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. Words to think about, isn't it? Some time ago, Father Renero Cantalamessa addressed a large crowd of people made up of many different fellowships and denominations. And this is what he said. When Christians quarrel, we say to God, choose between us and them. But the Father loves all his children. We should say, we accept as our brothers all those whom you receive as your children. I think those are good words and great sentiments. See, what he said of different fellowships and denominations is also true of each local church. It's important that we all love and respect and build one another up. We can't say to one person or another, if God loves you, I I'm not going to love you. That just doesn't work. Remember Paul wrote that those who quarrel or who are jealous, who divide, who envy, who feel everyone is wrong except for their own little group, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the way it ought to work in the church is that you may not like what someone else is doing, but it's incumbent on you to obey Romans 12, 18, which says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. The bottom line is, a church is a place of fellowship. In fact, we're called to fellowship. And of course, this is often hard work, and especially so in the midst of a pandemic when our associations with each other is limited or actually non-existent. But if you're getting anything from this sermon today, let it be this, that the Holy Spirit impresses on your heart and mind the ways you might be limiting his grace because of your understanding of the church. The church of Jesus Christ is, is wherever you are because you are part of the people of God, regardless of whether or not we're meeting together to worship in a building or online. The church of Jesus is wherever you are because you're his ambassador to your family when you venture out to get groceries, to get exercise walking in your neighborhood or on your social media platforms. The church of Jesus Christ also is wherever we are able to gather together in the building we've given the title church to again. Now, you may feel very frustrated, even angry, about the restrictions imposed because of the pandemic. I get it. 
can I ask you to pray that God will help you get beyond those feelings, the, the, that sense? If you'd like me to pray for you, let me know and I will. But I'd like to also urge you to stay connected with your church through the means you have available to you in the middle of this pandemic. And thank God, rather than be frustrated with the technological con connectivity, even if it's not what you prefer. The Church of Jesus Christ will thrive and grow because as Jesus himself declared, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, against you. So if I can give you something to think about at the end of this before I pray, it's this. Don't sweat the form the church is taking right now. It's still the church. And as you follow Jesus, you're still a part of it, an important part of it. Let's pray. Father, you're very aware of every person that's within the sound of my voice that's listening in on this uh, online sermon and service. We would much rather prefer to be gathering together and doing things with each other, namely worshiping, learning, fellowshipping, growing. But this pandemic has forced us to change the way that we do our form of church. And Father, I'm as frustrated as many people are. I'd love for this pandemic to be at an end. I'd love to see it just wiped away and the next morning everything is, is free and we can do and be whatever we want to be. But until that day, I'm asking for your grace. I'm, I'm asking for your grace in my own life and I'm asking for grace in the lives of the people who are within the sound of my voice. You know every bit about every one of them. You know they're coming, they're going, the thoughts that they have, you know the desires of their hearts, you know the frustrations, their anger, you know it all. And I know that you love them. Would you help us to clear our minds and our hearts and our emotions and focus on you? Would you allow us to be your ambassador in a way that's compelling and, and, and encouraging and people are drawn to? Thank you for making us part of your family and, and part of the people of God. Where would we be without that? Where would we be without you? Thank you that the church continues on even though we're not doing it in the form that we're used to anymore. But we know that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And that the future in you is full of hope. Please give us that hope today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit minister to you and work in your life. God bless you and I'll see you next time.